What lessons can we learn from the military strategy of the Maccabees? Every year during the holidays, I always like to review the framework that Rabbi Yitz Greenberg gives to the holidays in his classic introductory book, The Jewish Way. Um, it poses as a book for beginners, um, perhaps those looking to have an introduction to Judaism or to convert, but in his subtle way, he's able to bring a broad perspective to the holidays and to the calendar cycle that um, is sophisticated and speaks to our current sensibilities, translating uh, well the language of Judaism through its observances into our lives. As I was reading this year about the holiday of Hanukkah, I realized that he spends a lot of time on a subject that few other religious books spend any time on at all, the military campaigns and strategy of the Maccabees. So there are two different things uh, I wanted to highlight. The first the passage here, um, <laughs> who was revolting? You know, so there were the Hellenists, the Jewish Hellenists, the people that supported the Hellenization of culture and those things associated with Greek Seleucid rule. Um, there were moderate Hellenists, people caught up in the cultural milieu, um, but not ideologically or extremely. And then there were those, the tzaddikim, the chassidim, the righteous, who were revolting in armed rebellion. Where were those people? Who were they? Most of those people, um, at least according to R Rabbi Greenberg, were farmers in the Judean countryside. Um, they were simple people. They tended to be poor, and they tended to be the most distant from the cosmopolitan, as it were, values of the Hellenists. It's interesting to think, just as an aside, about this kind of disparity between those in the urban centers, the educated, and those uh, who were farmers living not in urban centers, but in a countryside. Um, perhaps holding more firmly um, to certain historically traditional values and how that maps onto how we think about relations in our country. But that's a topic for a different time. The main point here is that they were not uh, experts in military strategy or armed combat. So how were they to engage in a successful revolt? Um, and so he points out, I'll quote. And so Mattathias's band began a guerrilla war that depended on mobility and superior knowledge. Again, depended on mobility and superior knowledge of the terrain. The mountains granted them inaccessibility and allowed strategic maneuvering. This tactic proved crucial in the unfolding of the revolt. Um, <laughs> When we think about a guerrilla war, mobility and superior knowledge of the terrain, it's hard not to imagine broadcasting here. It looks like Jerusalem on the virtual background if you're looking at the video version of this. Um, but we're in New England here and it's um, easy to think about the Continental Army and the, the colonists revolting against the British, um, relying on just the same factors. So let's let's make a drasha out of this first piece for a minute. Mobility and superior knowledge of the terrain. Um, imagine that we weren't fighting a war against the Greeks, but we were fighting a war as the Maccabees were for kedusha, for sanctity and holiness, meaning and purpose imbued in our daily lives in a secular culture increasingly automated technological and without narrative stories and compelling values that are shared uh, that um, direct the ways we feel on a day-to-day -day basis. 
that's the world we live in. One of despair, depression, anxiety, and isolation, even in the best of times, even before a global pandemic. Mobility and superior knowledge of the terrain. Modern orthodoxy, <laughs> there's a distinct brand or stripe that I'm invested in promoting, but not from a partisan perspective. Mobility. So the Rambam famously said that you should accept the truth from whoever says it. And it wasn't just a motto of his, obviously. Um, he was open to philosophical truths from Aristotelian or other traditions um, if he felt they were right. And he was willing to engage in pretty strong um, reinterpretation and contextualization of traditional Torah messages um, if necessary in order to do that. And so too, it's not just Maimonides, right? We can look to Maimonides as some kind of um, educated example. But the question is, do we follow his example in our time? Because we haven't stopped learning things. In fact, we've learned a whole lot and the rate of learning is increasing. Mobility, are we flexible? Now, this can seem like the enemy of tradition, the values antithetical to those of the Maccabees, but you've got to have some of it. At every key stage in Jewish history, the movements that have succeeded are those which respond to the emerging needs, the felt needs of people in their lives. So the question is, do we have the mobility, the flexibility, not to relate to our Jewish practice only as precisely the way it was done and view in context any change therefore as inauthentic or veering from it, but instead bring the whole of our tradition into the present moment, but relate to it with just the slightest dash of mobility such that we can adapt these crucial truths and even the codified legal expressions of them in our halachic system in such a way that they make sense, that they're plausible now. Not ignorant, but not ignorant of the terrain, but with mobility as a conscious factor. It's one we're proud of. It's one we don't apologize for. Superior knowledge of the terrain. You know, most of us live in the world. Um, I think as a community, we have a lot of education. And so the range of areas in which we have expertise is quite diverse. It relates to basically all the areas uh, that one can have expertise when you combine the accumulated knowledge of our communities. We have psychologists and psychiatrists for an example. I'll cite this as the example because I think it's the most important and least utilized lens that, through which the Torah can be viewed. Um, you know, in their way, the Hasidim did this a little bit in the Musser movement. Also, it's kind of like behavioral therapy, right? Is, okay, so the Torah says all of these things, but as we know, our cognitive biases, our habits, our faults, and as manifest in action, because after all, Judaism is an action-oriented religion, um, it's a struggle to apply what we know, what we feel to be toho kivaro, to have our innards match our outer expression, the olam yehayadam yereshamayim b'seiter uvagaloi, right? Uh, <laughs> should fear have an inside and out. So how to have that integration? Um, that's a challenge and it's really the tool of psychology, um, behavioral psychology, to shed light on the ways in which we think and how our thoughts and emotions um, and our physical experience and environments interact in ways that we can apply the lessons of Torah um, to be better people, to present in the world as kinder. You know, the Torah, not just as a random set of things we do or an obligation we've inherited, but as a blueprint or roadmap for refining our character and our actions, becoming fully actualized human beings living in the divine image. That's the goal. Superior knowledge of the terrain, to study, to listen to podcasts, to read, 
to research and view that not as apart from the Torah, but as fully integrated into understanding the world in which we live and therefore applying the Torah. Right? The Torah is not unrelated to it and even helping to understand the benefit of certain practices, how, what new practices might emerge and how we might take mitzvot and package them in ways that work more effectively for us. Take an example, um, you know, a very practical example. I think people uh, struggle with it a lot. I've heard Rabbi Erwin Kula speak about this in a certain context um, on a couple of occasions. Right, but Kriya Shamala Mita, I think it's neglected. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go out and say it's neglected. Um, one of the great problems people have these days is sleep. People struggle to sleep. Okay, it's the light from the screens, it's the anxiety, whatever it is, disconnect from circadian rhythms. But point is, a lot of people struggle with sleep. Insomnia is a major problem. And if you'd sign on to any kind of shared meditation or yoga app at a certain hour of the middle of the night, you'd see you know, millions, thousands of users, your neighbors, if you could locate them, struggling to sleep and relying on technology to try and fall asleep. And yet, we have in our tradition this tool, Kriya Shema Lamita, which says even though you've already fulfilled your evening obligation for Shema in Ma'ariv and Arbit, and so it's done, it's not about a technical obligation, but there are demons of the night in the language of the Gemara. Now, the Gemara had particular demons in mind, and insomnia probably wasn't it, but, but that's our demon, right? And... And so here comes Kriya Shema Lamita, a set of prayers, if you've never said them, that relate to saying the Shema, a bracha blessing about sleep falling on your eyelids, but also about Harini and Imo I forgive, I let go of the injuries that were directed against me in the day. You know, those people also didn't sleep enough the night before, and that might be why they said the thing they shouldn't have said. Maybe it's not about me, maybe it's them. Whatever it is, it's easier for me to let go of the, I let go. And also I ask for forgiveness and I reflect. And so there's a container, this space to reflect on the day, to let go of the parts that were hard, to take with some lessons for a curse of improvement because tomorrow will be another day, and to let it all go and to rest and to say Shema, and to transcend, to say that God is one. And to kind of um, allow ourselves to be held in a transcendence, capital T, that is so much bigger and deeper and loving and supportive, like a blanket, a spiritual blanket for the night. And so that's an example of the way in which we might frame Torah, greater superior knowledge of the terrain. Um, there's a final piece. Rabbi Greenberg says, the entire process forced a choice on many Jews who had been drifting into Hellenism. In the crunch, seeing their Jewish brothers defending their home soil, seeing the destruction of local Jewish populations to advance the interests of Syrians made many people decide that they were primordially Jews, not Hellenists. Judah and his band might never have succeeded, but for the shift of moderate Hellenizers to the side of the revolt. Thus, what started as a revolt of the fundamentalists became a viable coalition of simple traditionalism and moderate Hellenization. That's a great idea, an incredible idea, that the Hasidim, the righteous, the pious, the zealots willing to fight to the death, even if victory had almost no chance, were actually able to draw moderate folks to their side. And without that, their dreams actually never may have come to fruition. And so when we think about um, our religious identity, I think in the Orthodox world, often hear about the minhag, the custom, what we all do, um, there are increasingly narrower groups of people. And we ignore the fact that uh, many people, many Jews are open to a lot of the lessons about a rigorous practice that brings Kedusha and God presence, Shechina, into our lives after all. The Ramah notes, Rabbi Moshe Solis, right in the beginning of Shulchan Aruch, that the thoughts, actions, and movements of a person who is consciously acting in the presence of God before God right here are very different always than someone who doesn't have that consciousness. And aren't we, so many of us looking for that kind of 
presence in our lives, supporting loving, but also holding us accountable and inspiring us to live lives of purpose and meaning to our best ideals, uh, individually and collectively. And so um, the question is, will we continue to view our community in the narrowest of ways, look at the priorities only for ourselves, or will we be open to genuine outreach, which includes, of course, not just evangelizing, um, but also accepting the ideas of those who are outside. Rev. Cook was a master of this, and we'll close on this note. Rev. Cook understood and got in trouble for saying that there were certain ideals that religious people had that secular people lacked and needed. Um, but just the opposite was true, too. There were certain ideas that even heretics had, even Abi Corson, that religious people misunderstood. And one of them, for Rev. Cook, was the value of the nation and the land, that religious ideals had become too disconnected from tangible physical manifestations, and that the individual, as he says in Malach Ethiopia, Israel, the path of ideas in Israel, the trend towards individuation, individualism, um, and the individual religious psyche, and you know, what am I doing? Am I getting the right reward? My share in heaven it became disconnected from the Torah's natural focus and the Prayers, natural focus on the plural, on the collective, on Knesset Israel, on the community. This Hanukkah um, is a good chance to reflect. We light lights, and I see on my feed lots of people light Hanukkah lights, people from all different kinds of families and backgrounds. Um, it's popular, it's easy, it's accessible. Um, will we continue to be open to teaching and learning from and bringing in and expanding our coalition in order to live more purposeful, meaningful lives to fulfill our religious mission and vision. And how will we do it? 